Hello, welcome everyone. So, uh, my name is Juanpe, and I'm a consultant based in Berlin. And I'm going to talk today about immutable data structures. Now, the reason immutable data structures are interesting is because of value semantics. So, who here thinks value semantics are great? Yay, almost everyone. Some people didn't raise their hands. I hope they would if they had listened to this talk. Uh, so I, I think this confirms that the C++ community has developed a taste for value semantics. Um, and I mean, a lot of the standard libraries is value-based. We now know also how to do, for example, open world polymorphi polymorphism with value semantics. But then again, when it gets to lifting as values, uh, core components of our architecture, thinking in architectural terms uh, as values is hard. And I've seen often teams fail uh, when trying to do so. And this is what I call uh, the tragedy of the value-based architecture. So this tragedy starts with a lot of good intentions. At the center of our architecture, we have our data model, which ideally we would like to have as a value type. This value type is a simple, it's simple data, right? Composed as a tree of vectors, maps, tuples, structs, whatever. Now, with this data, we can write our application logic as pure functions. Functions like this one that takes a document as a parameter and return a new document when they are done. <coughs> this function has no side effects, and it's really easy to test. So one of the very often advertised advantages of this architecture is that doing a relatively complicated feature like undo suddenly becomes very simple. You just keep your, the snapshots of your data model uh, of the previous states in something like an std vector, and you're done. Doing things asynchronously is equally simple. You can have a render thread for rendering your UI that just queries through, let's say, an inter-thread channel, a copy of the document, and draws it um, without problem. Same thing for, for example, saving the document asynchronously without interrupting the user. We can just capture the document by value in a lambda and save it in an asynchronous operation. And we can add more representations for the data, right? So I've worked a lot in the music software industry where we have also an audio thread that is a sonic representation of our document. And again, we can follow the same architectural patterns. There is a problem here, though. We're doing copies all over the place. And maybe if our data model is very simple, this kind of works. But if your document is hundreds of megabytes big, maybe gigabytes big, this simply doesn't scale. So what a good C++ developer will do is say, well, let's not do things by value. Just let's do the updates in place. Let's take the document by reference, and that's it. But suddenly, we completely broke the uh, value semantic uh, notion of our architecture. Our data model is no longer a value. Our, doc our, our data model is now an object. It's a location. It's a position in memory in which we store data. So now, we need to use logs to synchronize the render thread. And because we need to use logs, we probably keep a mutable view hierarchy somewhere. And we also need to add observers uh, to make sure it's uh, always updated. And we need to implement command patterns to do and undo everything every step. And doing persistence asynchronously is too hard, so we just don't do it. We probably will end up showing uh, these spinning clocks to the users. They're already used to that. But nothing is going to save us from the flying spaghetti code monster that is, has taken over our code. <laughs> so <laughs> let's think about the problem a little bit more. We dropped our ideal value-based architecture because of copying. That was our problem. And as C++ developers, we are hardwired to think that passing by value involves copying the data. But does this really need to be the case? I mean, we could store the value in an object that is in the heap, and just pass a pointer to this object around. The reason we cannot do this is because of mutability. In C++, all types are updated only via mutable interface. This means that if I just pass a pointer to this object where the value is stored, the value could disappear under my foot uh, in any moment, right? But if we remove mutability from this equation, we also remove this implication, right? It's mutability that Im implies that passing by value implies copying. We can achieve passing by value without copying as soon as we have an immutable interface. So I think that to attack this problem, uh, 
a good place to start is with the data structures, because they are basically the, the prime matter of which we build our data models. So we could imagine we have a magical vector type that can be always const, because all its methods are const. This vector type I can update using its pushback method, but this pushback method will not update the first vector in place. It will return a new version of the vector with the effects that we want applied to it. So it will return a new vector with the 15 pushback at the end. We can repeat this operation many times. We can also do other kinds of operations like setting um, a value at a random position in the vector. And the nice thing is that via this immutable uh, interface, we automatically achieved a property that in the data structures uh, world is called persistence, and in particular, full persistence. Because basically, the old versions of my document are still there. They're not destroyed. <coughs> we can compare them, compare the past with the present. We can also branch the past and create new versions of the future. Of the future. <coughs> These properties are really interesting, especially for interactive programming, which is one of the topics that preoccupies me a lot. Because being able to compare the past with the present means that change becomes a first class, a first class value uh, of our program that we can reason about. We can compare the past with the present. Change is just there. <clears throat> but another interesting property is that you can achieve a structural sharing. Since everything is const, this Different versions of the vectors, they don't need to be full copies of each other. They can share data internally. This property is called structural sharing. And this means, as I said, that there is no more copying when, when I pass the value. I can pass the value by basically copying a pointer or a couple of pointers. <coughs> and now I can also get a compact representation of the history. It also means that comparing the past and the present is fast because they share a lot of data. I can see which branches uh, didn't change. So I wanted such data structure to exist for a very long time, and I ended up writing, um, <coughs> sorry, writing one myself, uh, which you can download from that web page. And I set up a set of goals uh, for this implementation. The first one is that it should be idiomatic. There is a lot of work done in immutable data structures, also in C++, that ends up pretending that C++ is Haskell. And I think if we really want to um, open these other structures to a wider audience, it has to feel idiomatic in the world of C++. For similar reasons, it has to be performant. We're using C++ not because we think it's the most expressive language in the world. We use it because we need performance. So these data structures that I implemented, they are cache efficient, and also I use met methodologies to ensure that they are written using the most efficient techniques. This should also be customizable. And this is related to performance, right? Because there are trade-offs that you have to make uh, all the time that affect performance. So I use policy-based design and other te techniques to make sure that you can really adapt um, the, the data structures to the performance characteristics of your system. This also means that these data structures could be used to be embedded in higher level languages that have a runtime greater in C or C++. <coughs> So this gets us to the part two, in which I'm going to talk a little bit about how does this magical vector type works. First, let's understand a little bit how this uh, property of the structural sharing works. And for this, we can use the typical example of an immutable list. A list is composed of nodes that have a pointer to the next element. So I can have a list with this element A, and I can push to the front of this list new nodes to create a second value and this second value still has a reference to the value that was, uh, or to the element that was in the other value. <coughs> I can do this again, get another third version of the list, and I can also fork the past and create another branch. Now, all this shared a, lo a lot of data, right? And it's because the data is sliced into small nodes that is connected uh, between each other. Now, of course, linked lists, they are not so great, right? They are bad. Um, they use the cache inefficiently. They create data dependencies. And even algorithmically, they are not so interesting, right? Because they don't support random access, et cetera. Nonetheless, using this small node principle, there are lots of interesting data structures you can build. 
I recommend this book uh, by Chris Okazaki, um, especially if you're into Haskell, because that's what you will read if you will implement uh, data structures in Haskell. This is another interesting data structure that you might uh, find uh, that is targeted to towards uh, purely functional languages. But C++ is not a purely functional language. C++ doesn't deal nicely with the small nodes. But there are other data structures we can use. In particular, I find notable the work from Phil Bagwell, who over the last decade did a lot of work in investigating data structures that are cash efficient, yet they can be implemented in a persistent manner. And I think it's notable also to mention here Rich Hickey, who is the author uh, of the language closure, because he's the first person to take these data structures that Phil Bagwell made, do maybe um, his own modifications on them, and then make a bold decision. He made a lisp that is not fundamentally based on lists, that is uh, based on immutable vectors based on these data structures. And I think this is really one of the fundamental um, ingredients to the success of closure. So how does such immutable vector work? Ideally, we would like to have a sequence of values that is in a block, a perfectly continuous block, something like an array. But we know that if we store the data in this way, we will need to copy all the data whenever we have another version. But we can reach a compromise and just split it into chunks. Now, if I wanted to update one of the elements, I only need to copy the chunk in which this element is stored. On the other hand, just splitting the array into chunks does not give us a data structure. There is no way, I mean, these things are floating up in the air. So how do we interconnect these things together? We could interconnect them in a list, but then we have, again, a lot of the problems that lists have. But we can say, OK, let's store pointers to all these chunks in a vector. Now, we created the same problem again. We have a vector here that could grow indefinitely uh, or we have an array here to be more consistent in the terminology that can grow indefinitely as we add elements to it. However, we can apply again the same solution. Slice it into chunks. We have now two chunks floating up in the air, but we can connect them, adding another level. In this case, this level is already smaller than our chunk size, so we're, we're done. This data structure is called a radix balance tree, and it's characterized by a branching factor called m, which is a power of two. Now, in these slides, the power of two is based uh, on a B2, which means we have four elements. This is so the trees fit in the slides. But in practice, we actually use a big branching factor. We use a branching factor of 32, which means that you need five bits to index into one of these uh, chunks. <coughs> Now, you might be thinking as a C++ developer, OK, this is still a tree. We hate trees. That's why we don't use std map. We use an order set or whatever. <clears throat> but think about one thing. This tree grows very slowly. In fact, you can have a vector that has all the elements that you can index with a 32-bit a integer, and this will only have seven levels deep. The truth is that, actually, if you have a vector that is uh, so big <coughs> that is actually, for example, more than four levels big, the, and you still want to do random access into it, the problem you have is not actually how this deep tree, uh, this tree is, is that you're doing random access in data that doesn't fit in your, in your catch anyway. Actually, the problems of lack of memory locality there are higher, uh, orders of magnitude higher than simply the depth of the tree. This is why, in practice, a lot of the authors that study this data structure say that this data structure provides effectively constant uh, random access. Because even though there is a tree, the tree is so flat that, in practice, it's other factors that are more important than the depth of, of the tree. OK, so how do we look up an element in this tree? <clears throat> Let's say we want to access the element in the index 17 of the tree. To do this, we will split the index in groups of b bits, this b being the exponent of the two that we saw before for the branching factor. So now we simply take the first group of bits, and we look up in the root node 
uh, what's the slot that corresponds to this uh, sub-index. We traverse down the tree and simply go to the next block. Recursively, we apply this operation. We find this is in the first index, the first slot. And finally, in the leaf chunk, we find that the element we're looking for is in the uh, second slot. To do this, we only need simple bit shift operations, right? So it's bit shifts and indirections, the only thing uh, we're doing here. Now, when we want to update the element, let's say we want a new version of the vector with this element updated. We will first, of course, traverse down to this element. And then we will start copying the data up in the tree. So first, we will need to copy the chunk in which the element exists. Now we'll book, we will go up and copy this node here from the, from the tree. We copy it, of course, changing the first pointer to point, uh, to point to the new block that we just copied before. But the other pointers are copied as they were. We go back up, create a copy of the root, and in the end, we end up with this new tree. There is, of course, some amount of data that we needed to copy. We needed to copy basically one path down the tree. But the rest of the tree is basically shared between the two of them. And this is how we achieve this balance that you can control via the branching factor between how much um, structural sharing you want and how much uh, copying you want to do between in each operation update operation. So when we look at it algo algo algorithmically, <coughs> the operations of this immutable vector are actually similar to that of a normal mutable vector, of course with higher constants. So we have effective O1 random access, update, pushback, a slice right, which would be something similar to a resize. At the same time, we have O N insertion, conc concatenation, push front and slice left, which there is a cheap solution you can do also to turn them effective O1. But I'm more interested in some more non-trivial changes to it. Now, why do we need to move everything uh, in an insertion? Of course, this is because if, let's say, I want to insert something next to the O here, I will need to push the P to make space for this new element out of the chunk this will move into the next chunk, and basically this propagates until the end of the vector, very similarly to how it happens in a normal mutable vector. But in a paper that was published like four years ago, um, it was shown that, well, we could relax the, that, the structure a little bit. So instead of being perfectly balanced, we could be a little bit unbalanced. So we can have nodes uh, in the middle that have actually less elements than they would otherwise. This means that we need to not add a little bit more data to the parent nodes. We need to add information about how many elements does each subtree contain. Now, the trick here is that uh, Phil Bagwell showed that there is a concatenation algorithm that you can do that happens in logarithmic time. In this case, proper logarithmic time, not effective O1, um, that basically rebalances the tree. Oops, such that, the, uh, such that at most, you are adding one more search step when you're looking for an element in this relaxed structure. This is why this uh, data structure is called the relaxed radix balance tree. So now if we look at the table of operations, we have, again, effective O1 operations for the typical vector ones. But now we have logarithmic concatenation, insertion, and push front, which is excellent when you have like really large vectors that you update interactively. Now, there is still one problem. So this data structure, I'm showing it like this, but it's normally implemented in, let's say, the JVM or something like this where it actually doesn't look like this. It looks like this, right? Because in these other languages, all values are boxed. This means that the leaf nodes, they actually contain a pointer to the element, not the element itself. Now, if we're doing C++, we don't want to do this. We want to unbox the values. We want to store the values directly in the leaf. So you could say, OK, let's just do that. But then what happens? if the elements are big. We could have elements that are quite wide, and now suddenly my leaf nodes become quite wide as well. 
This kind of breaks the balance that we found. And it breaks it in a way that is uh, of which the data structure writer has no control. If you just put a big element, then suddenly the data structure doesn't perform the way you would expect it to. So I found a way to solve this, which is basically using a different branching factor in the leaf nodes. If you have fat leaf nodes, you store less of them. So let's say, in this case, this leaf element is twice as big as a pointer, so I just store half of them. Likewise, if we, has, if we have a small elements, we can store, let's say, twice as many in a leaf node, maintaining kind of the performance characteristics that we uh, originally uh, studied. So this data structure is called the embedding uh, balance tree. And as I just said, the difference is that instead of having just one branching factor, we have two of them, where the second one is the branching factor for, for the leaf nodes. What remains is, OK, what is the branching factor that we're going to uh, assign to the leaf nodes? And basically, it's going to be, of course, a power of two. So we just compute uh, how many bits we're going to use to address it. And basically, intuitively, we can think of it's as many elements as fit in an inner node. And for this, well, we divide the size of an inner node by the size of the element, and then compute the logarithmic, uh, the logarithm and round it. So this data structure performs quite well. I was happy, but there was still something creepy about the smile. Let's look at this piece of code, which is a little bit problematic. This function is quite simple. It just takes a vector and populates the vector, pushing at the end every element between first and last, returning a new version of the element with this operation applied to it. But there is a problem with it. Can anyone tell me what is the problem with this function? No? There is a performance problem with this function. Huh? You don't reserve. I mean, that could be part of the problem. At the same time, we're going to allocate blocks anyways. But it's related to that. I mean, the problem is that here we're creating new versions of the vector all the time, but we're discarding, discarding the new version in the next iteration. So as you saw from the previous algorithm, there are going to be some nodes copied that they're going to be released as soon as you iterate in the next version of the loop. So the problem is that we're using a persistent API in a point in which actually we don't, like, we don't need persistence. Because for, for us, this function is a transaction. We're interested in the vector that comes in and in the one that comes out. The one that are produced in the middle, we don't care. So there is actually a solution that the closure people already found for this. And this is the notion of transience. So you can take an immutable vector and say, please, give me a transient vector as opposed to a persistent one. And a transient vector is basically one that has a mutable API, but that internally, of course, shares this uh, the same data structure. Now we can use a mutable API to update it. And when we say, OK, we're happy with this version of the vector, we just call persistent to get an immutable, an immutable value out of it. Of course, this transient thing has to respect the persistence of the value that came in, so that it will use some technique uh, to track the ownership of the new nodes that it creates in this intermediate thing. So it knows with no, uh, which nodes are safe to update in place and which nodes are not. But this achieves uh, like a significant uh, performance improvement. Actually, this code is very often faster than uh, pushing back on a, on a mutable vector because of some op optimizations that are involved. Now, another advantage of this API goes uh, with what I said before about trying to be idiomatic. Because C++ is based on the assumption of mutability, all the STL algorithms assume you have a mutable API. So with this mutable API, we can pass the containers to, let's say, STL algorithms. So we could rewrite the loop with an STL algorithm. Now, <coughs> At the same time, I found that this transient API actually is completely needed in closure 
because in closure you have garbage collection, so you normally don't track the ownership of the elements. I actually support garbage collection via libgc, but most of the time, by default, a C++ developer will use uh, reference counting. And if you have refer reference counts all the time, it means you always have fresh information on which nodes, uh, on, on what is the aliasing on the nodes. So another way to achieve exactly the same performance as with the, uh, the code I showed before is to simply move the value before we pass it to the update operation. Since we move it, we are telling it, OK, this variable, or the reference that you're getting here, has no aliases. If that reference has no aliases, the only thing that remains to check is what are the aliasing, the reference counts of the nodes that are actually contained in the tree. In the tree. If some of them has a reference count of one, just update them in place. Now, in this case, you could argue that this move here might be a little bit bad for some C++ developers that, let's say, it's uh, mistake prone, so maybe the other interface is better. But there is a lot of value still in having this interface, right? Because you may write a function like this, in which you push back, let's say, a few elements, and you operate directly in the intermediate values. These intermedi intermediate values here, even if you don't move them, they are already air value uh, reference boundable, right? So these pushback operations here, they're going to be, um, they're gonna be uh, optimized for you anyways. <coughs> and I think this provides an interesting insight, which is that thanks to move semantics, especially if you're disciplined about using move semantics in your code, even if you're using a purely immutable interface uh, in all your operations, the actual performance cost of it is not going to depend on whether you choose to use a mutable API or an immutable API. You can choose to always use the immutable API, and it's going to be um, the actual cost of it is going to depend on the runtime amount of aliasing. It's a dynamic property. <coughs> So the question is, is this fast? And admittedly, I have many benchmarks, but I don't have time to run through them. So I'm going to just say yes. And I'm going to make a small comment on it. Uh, first, of course, uh, iterating over these data structures, especially if you use internal iteration with something like a for each, is really fast. It's actually between 1.5 and 2 times as fast as iterating over an std vector which I think is, is great. It's almost needly for a lot of uh, use cases. And it could even be optimized more because I didn't introduce like manual prefetching um, operations, which I think could make it even faster. Then, of course, when you think about updates, the updates that cannot be optimized, they're going to be slower because, as you saw, you're copying a few nodes on each of them. But at the same time, these updates, what you're doing is amortizing the cost of the copies over your updates. So of course, this is not going to uh, make sense everywhere. But in many, many um, use cases, especially in the use case that I showed in the beginning, this is going to allow different architectural patterns that, in the end, achieve much lower latencies and much more interactivity and actually much more uh, performance in the end. So anyways, I don't want you to just take my word for it. So I wrote a test program. And this gets us to the final part of this presentation, which is I put a spell, meaning these magic vectors, in a text editor. So I actually wrote a simple program. And this program is a text editor whose architecture and its data model is based purely on these immutable data structures. So before we actually talk about how it's done, I'm going to just do a small demo. So oops, 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 oops. All right. So I have this file here. This is a text file that contains all the Esperanto Wikipedia. It's almost one gigabyte big. I challenge you to edit it with your favorite text editor. I'm going to tell you. Huh? With Vim also. I <laughs> challenge accepted. Uh, I tried it actually with Vim, with all of them. Vim is actually quite. Not too bad, but still chokes a little bit on it. I'm going to show you how it works with my text editor. 
Of course, it's a lot of data that you have to put into memory, so it takes a little bit to load in the beginning. But it's not too, fa uh, too slow, actually. And now, oh, it's cropping the, the beginning of the, uh, of the screen. You know, I can edit it, and it's, it works quite fast, actually. Before I show you more impressive operations, I'm going to show you a stupid thing that I'm still quite proud of. This asterisk here is the dirty marker. Now, in most text editors, when you edit your file and you edit it back, not by undoing, but by removing, let's say, the characters that you introduce, the dirty marker uh, does not disappear. It didn't now also. I think it's because I added something that I'm not yeah. seeing in the screen. I added something in the beginning. Yeah. So I'm going to do it again here. Add something, and then at some point, it disappears, even though I just press delete. Why is this so? Because I can reason about change. I have no dirty markers in my program. The only thing I do is I just keep a copy to the text that was last loaded or saved. And when I draw the screen, I just say, is my current version of the document equals to the last document I saved to disk? So not only is the code simpler, in a way it also uh, or from a feature point of view, it, it's more correct in some way. But there are more impressive things I can do. I can, let's say, jump until the end of the file. You see there are, uh, I don't know, 20 million lines. I can press copy, no problem. Jump in the middle, paste it. Actually, I can paste it many times, no problem. <laughs> I can still edit it, no problem, right? This is interesting, actually. This file is now so big that if I saved it and loaded it again, I will not have enough memory. <laughs> but because of a structural sharing, when I copied it and pasted it in the middle, some nodes were created, of course, because of the concatenation algorithm and everything. But most of the data is actually shared between the different versions, right? So actually, the whole code of it is like 1,000 lines of code, including like dealing with the terminal and everything. Uh, and it's online. Uh, uh, you can study the code a little bit. I'm going to still uh, talk about uh, the most interesting things uh, of it. So <clears throat> this is actual code that is taken from, from the source code that you can see on GitHub. And basically, the most uh, important part of the application is this update function that I don't show here, but you can look at the signature. And the signature is, I take an application as a value, the whole application, <coughs> there for you. I take an event as a value also, so it might include the key that you press and what's the size of the window. And then I return a whole application. It's actually an optional, because the way I signal that I'm done is that there is no application anymore, right? <coughs> so then basically, the, the actual main loop of this application is somewhere where I create this uh, 2E object, which is just to interface uh, with the terminal. And then I have this state variable here, which is an instance of this application type. And I may initialize it with the contents of, of the first buffer and with a key map that you can customize. I use Emacs normally, so uh, I use a Emacs key binding definition. Uh, the interesting thing about this variable, this is the only single mutable variable that persists through the lifetime of the whole application. This is a pattern that I didn't invent. Actually, the closure people call this the single atom uh, architecture, because in closure, to define a mutable variable, you have to call this atom. It's maybe something similar to the IRF that we saw this morning in the Haskell talk. And the idea is that you only have one of these, right? You have one of these that then when a significant event occurs, you might update. But the myth of it is not the update. The myth of it, or it's not the, the mutation aspect of it. It's more the declarative update that you do here, where this function, I can easily write tests that basically, uh, in a very unit test fashion, I can still test complex behavior about the whole uh, application, right? So the main part of the application in the end is this loop, where we basically call update on the next event that we query from the UI. This, of course, is an effect, right? We're telling the world what is the, the next thing that happened. 
But when we have it as a value, we basically uh, query it with our pure function and see if we, the application should still be running, update the actual mutable variable, redraw, and keep going, right? So this is quite simple. And this, is, this picture, I didn't make it myself. This picture is actually from the Flags architecture that the Facebook people uh, propose for writing front-end front code for uh, browser-based applications. And in a way, this architecture is kind of an alternative for the traditional MVC thing. And the names, maybe the terminology is a little bit different from what I used, uh, but not too different. The interesting thing here is that as opposed to the traditional MVC in which you have different arrows going in all directions, and these arrows representing objects that live in memory and know about each other, this architecture has arrows all in the same direction. And more importantly, the arrows here didn't represent objects that know about each other. They represent pure functions that take one of these things and produce something, right? So this architecture allows us to change also the way we design our program. So we can take a more uh, data-driven approach. This is basically all the data structures involved in the text editor that, that, I, that I just showed. <coughs> and the, next th the nice thing about uh, this data-driven approach is that basically we can try to first design our data to simplify the invariants and make them as simple to me as possible, right? So here we can see <coughs> the thing I mentioned before about the, the dirty marker, right? So there is no dirty flag in the buffer. Instead, there is this file object that contains the file name of uh, the thing I loaded. Uh, and it, it contains the last content that was either loaded or saved. This is the current content of the buffer. And I just have to compare these two contents to get the dirty marker. Similarly, for the undo history, it's just a collection of snapshots, where each snapshot is some piece of text, which is the whole contents of the buffer, plus the cursor. And we basically rely on a structural sharing to know that these snapshots, snapshots they're not going to be too big. The representation for the text, I mean, it's a bit naive. I'm using white charts to make the Unicode uh, handling easier. I guess uh, you could use uh, unique, like UTF-8. Um, but here, what you can see is that I'm using uh, this flex vector from, from the library that I use, which is basically uh, the vector enhanced with the logarithmic concatenation, right? And this is what allows to do a structural sharing also when you're inserting things in the middle. And basically, this is it. So I think this is cool. There is something more uh, I wanted to talk about. But I think the session today is a little bit too short for it. It's about the word postmodernism in the title. Some people complained about it in the reviews. So I decided to make a long response to it, or a five minutes one, that is going to be tomorrow in a lightning talk. Uh, for the rest of it, uh, these are the links to all the code that I showed today. Uh, so this is the, the library of immutable data structures. The second link is the uh, text editor. Um, and this is it. Look at it. I think uh, maybe you might find it useful. And I think we might have. Uh, five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Yep. Right. Well. <laughs> Vittorio? Great work, impressive. Uh, I'm curious, in the text editor, did you use multi framing at all? Or is it just uh, uh, I, I did not. Um, it's one of the things that I would like to do uh, in the future, actually, because I think that's part of uh, kind of the architectural things that I, I would like to highlight. Um, that, for example, will make loading asynchronously, right? Which at the moment we had to wait until it appeared. You could as well have like a progress bar and edit it from the beginning. Um, yeah, but you can also do it yourself if you're, if you're interested. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. If you wanted to modify your text editor such that when you loaded it up, it would show immediately mm -hmm. and then continue loading off the bottom. Yeah. So I think what I will do is um, I will use Boost Asio to do the loading asynchronously. And basically, I will load a chunk of data. And then I will send it to the main thread and append it 
to the current context of the editable buffer. And in this case, uh, I think uh, the idea is that you can already start editing, right? And the new data that is going to come back is going to come after what you're seeing anyways, right? So you can just simply uh, push back um, the data at the end um, when, when it's loaded. For other use cases, it might be more complicated, actually. And this is uh, one of the questions I sometimes get. What happens if I do things concurrently and my versions diverge? And then how do, you, how do I reconcile the changes afterwards? Uh, I don't know if your question was a little bit poking into that direction in which um, at the moment I don't have very good support for that. I think um, that's one of the things I, I would like to work on beyond, of course, adding more data structures like associative maps, which is basically uh, providing operations uh, to easily diff two versions. Uh, so you can say, what's the differences between these two things? Um, and conversely, merge them, right? So say, please apply this set of changes. Of course, you might still have conflicts, and only your application logic can actually resolve the conflicts, I think. But Yes? So um, the idea of using a, a, the R values as a signal to open up the mutable interface is, is interesting. But normally the way we would do that is by having a separate type of the builder. And in particular, the builder should be able to pre-calculate the total amount. Like, typically, you can calculate one at a call from Ally mm -hmm. uh, ahead of time. And then you need a bunch of arguments to the builder to fill, fill that one block. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in that case, it depends on your use case, right? Because the problem with pre allocating one single block is that you're going to need to keep the single block around only if you actually only have a reference to a small part of it uh, in your application at the moment, right? Because it might happen that because of new updates that you do afterwards, you forget about a lot of the elements uh, of the parts of this block and you only remain to one of it. Uh, so I, I consider that solution less general. On the other hand, I agree that for uh, a lot of use cases, uh, that might be a better approach. I know, for example, that the act actually the Scala um, implementation of this uses the builder pattern, but I think they don't still allocate one single block. They still allocate uh, small blocks. Um, another way maybe to apply that kind of optimization is maybe with custom allocators. So um, I support a custom allocator interface, which it's not based on STD allocators, uh, in part also because at the moment I don't want to carry the state or a pointer to the allocator in the data structure, so they can only be global. Um, and I use them already in my default uh, configuration to provide, uh, for example, a free list for nodes, right? Because we saw that thanks to the, this embedding data structure, all the nodes are more or less the same size. So they can actually even be shared across data structures of different types. So it actually pays off to maybe have like a free list of one megabyte of uh, nodes that just disappeared and you want to reuse. Uh, but yeah. Uh, I just came to a conversation of the relaxed <coughs> and it's of what? So the relaxed tree. Yeah. And it's huge and looks really complicated. So I want to know who was the process in developing it and making sure it was correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a, a long process. Um, yeah, so actually, um, this was after I quit my last job. I spent a few months uh, reading papers and implementing. And um, I did like first versions that were a bit less complicated. So you see, for example, that I do the reference counting manually. Um, and this is because I really tried to uh, optimize the, oh, sorry. <laughs> so the question was the implementation of the relaxed uh, vector is quite complicated. What was the process to actually make it work? Um, so I actually started with kind of a simpler version and then slowly made it more complicated, basically, by adding uh, iteratively the manual um, reference counting, uh, the exception handling, blah, blah. Uh, also, I mean, I've, I follow like a test-driven approach, so I try to, to come up with complicated tests. Uh, I even have like some tests that try to randomly like drop exceptions in in weird moments. Um, this is still one thing that I want to work more on, so I'm uh, looking forward to using something like Clam Fuzzy to, to provide me like even more confidence on, on the robustness uh, of it. 
but yeah. <laughs> Do we have time for another question? Or is there any other question? No, so, well, thank you very much. Also, I mean, I really like talking about this topic, so if you want to talk more about it, just grab me in any time, and let's chat. Oh, was one your more question. Talk? Was it tonight or tomorrow? It's tomorrow, yeah. I still have to prepare it a little bit, because it's a bit longer than it should be, so. But <laughs> yeah. Cool, thank you.